Hello again. I've been looking at predictive tools to look at pacing in longer endurance events. I wasn't sure whether they'd work very well, but they've actually been surprisingly accurate. And uh, I haven't really found out what I expected to find. Actually, the results have been quite interesting. Well, as you probably can work out, if you do a long event that's hilly, you're going to have to have a variable power. You know, you can't ride it all at the same power, even though you might think that was the most efficient. I'm not sure it is actually the most efficient. But you can't ride downhills at the same power that you can ride uphills. And actually it's more efficient to ride uphills harder than it is to, uh, to ride downhills harder. If you're riding uphill, you're going slower and therefore there's less, less aerodynamic drag, less resistance from the wind. Uh, and you, but you're working ag against gravity more. And that's actually a more efficient way to, uh, to adjust your pace. So I've got some data from the Transatlantic Way Race a few years ago. And what I did is I see, see whether I could predict the, uh, the time that the, uh, the rider did using a tool called Best Bike Split. I've used Best Bike Split before, but for shorter events, uh, were really to help uh, Karen Dark in, in her training for the Paralympics. And we found some really insightful information from it. So I thought, I wonder if I can find some similarly useful information in, uh, for longer events. Anyway, the prediction was pretty accurate. So I investigated whether it was worth going for the high variability where you're going up into your, maybe your threshold zone or whether it's better to stay in the tempo zone. And what I found is actually once you get beyond a certain level of variability, um, it doesn't matter, your ride times don't come down. Although, I mean, it does mean that you can spend more time at lower powers. And if my theory was correct, then the level of variability might be, there might be a sort of sweet, sweet spot, not, not sweet spot training, but a sweet point uh, of intensity whereby it's better to go a little bit harder sometimes so that you can go a bit, a bit easier at other times and recover. To verify that my findings from the transatlantic way were, were reasonable, I took a, a Tour de France stage that's in the Best Bike Split database, and which is quite a f just some big hills to see whether that uh, was the same and I found that it was much the same. So what we're finding is that there's no actual, for a given normalized power, there doesn't seem any benefit in going above your tempo zone. I then did a bit of comparison between the day one and day two rides for the particular rider. And there's actually a big difference in the average power and the normalized power that they produced during the two days. Day two was much longer in duration, but the power was much lower. And what I found is that it is a little bit faster if you can ride a bit easier on the first day and then on subsequent days you can that means you can you've got a little bit more energy available and you can ride at a higher power but obviously we don't really know whether that's possible and it certainly doesn't seem to pan out in the data that i've looked at and anecdotal data that i've found from talking to people it seems that most riders ride faster on the on the first day and then settle down into a and a comfortable pace. And then the other thing you can do in best bike split, particularly, I don't know if you can do it in other tools, it gives various options for looking at different parameters. If you go to this time analysis tab, see the second day was 119 watts. If you average the power over the two days, you might get to about 125 watts. And you can see the time saving would be half an hour. And, uh, and that, that can be quite useful. If you can manage your weight a bit more carefully, it might not mean that you can lose weight. You don't have to lose weight to reduce the weight, but you might be able to say, rather than stock up fully on, wa on the water that you carry and maybe just fill up one bottle if you know there's gonna be lots of resupply points, then what, what you can find is that you might save a kilo if you're careful about supplying food and careful about filling uh, your water bottles. And then you, well, okay, you only save seven minutes in 17 hours, but it's not very much, but these things can add up and you can play about with different things. And you might find you can be a little bit more aerodynamic. So once you've tuned, if you tune these drag coefficients by just using the information to predict the performance on, on a few rides that you do, just your training rides, then you've got a reasonable idea of your, what's known as your CDA, your aerodynamic drag, also your CRR, your rolling resistance. And then you can adjust them and see whether, well, if I can improve my drag coefficient a little bit, then how am I gonna save some time? And you can see that based on this model, if you can improve your drag coefficient by 10%, which might just be going on your tri bars more for more time. It might not even mean changing your setup. Or it might even just be, if you buy some tri bars and use them on the flat and the downhills, you've made a huge difference to your aerodynamic drag and therefore you're going faster. Other things you can do is look at climbs and it'll give you an estimate how long you take on various climbs. And then you can find out the, 
the longest climb in your event and you can train for that so that you maybe set the duration of some of your interval sessions so that you're training for a climb and the recovery if there's a, a period where you've got some um, medium length hills like it might be 10 to 15 minute hills with and then going back down again the, the other side and then another 10 to 15 minute hill you might find that you you're doing 10 minute climbs and three minute descents and as a consequence you could do like five by three ten minutes with three minutes recovery and uh, and then you sort of getting yourself specifically fit for that event so i think it's a great tool for planning working about your race strategy your pacing and, and informing your training and i've found some great insights by just looking at the the data playing about with these sliders and seeing what might and might not work. So what we found out? Well, we found out that variability is inevitable if you're doing a, a course, a real course over any distance, it's gonna have hills in it and therefore you're gonna to have to apply more power in certain parts on the uphills and less power on the, on the downhills. And actually that's a more efficient way to ride. If you look at equal normalized power, there doesn't seem to be any reason to ride higher than your tempo zone, although observation of uh, real ride data does seem to show that people are riding, spending significant time above the tempo zone. But when, when I originally started looking at this sort of thing, I didn't think they'd spend any time in tempo, but it seems that that's perfectly possible. And we found that these tools like Best Bike Split are fairly good for predicting uh, ride times in long events. And that's really useful for planning your training, your setup, and, and your pacing for the event. So I hope you found this useful. Please give it a like and subscribe if you have, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.